direct pathway is a really critical pathway of basal ganglia. Uh, it, is, it is the pathway that is most um, directly affected in Parkinson's disease, which is clearly the, the, basal, the most common basal ganglia disorder. Okay, so what is the direct pathway? It, it starts in, in motor cortex, and it come, the message comes into the striatum via unmyelinated axons. And in the striatum are medium spiny neurons that we talked about before. These are GABAergic medium spiny neurons that are going to inhibit the output neurons, the neurons of the globus pallidus par, uh, internal, the medial or internal globus, globus pallidus. These neurons are also GABAergic, and they also inhibit their target cells, which in this case is VAVL thalamus. And that information then gets sent back to, to motor cortex. If we zoom in on, on what's the bottom line here, which I've put down here, this is an excitation followed by an inhibition, followed by an inhibition, followed by an ex excitation. So plus, minus, minus, plus, and what do, you, what do you get when you multiply all those together? You get plus, okay? So the, what, the way to think about this is you have inhibited the, in, the resting, the default inhibition. By inhibiting the in inhibition, you have disinhibited. You have released these th thalamic neurons from their ongoing inhibition. As you may imagine, these neurons here in the uh, internal globus pallidus have resting discharge. Otherwise, there wouldn't be this default inhibition of, of movement. So this resting discharge, these are always inhibiting this thalamus, these thalamic neurons. And when the direct pathway is engaged, these neurons will prevent these globus pallidus internal cells from inhibiting the thalamic neurons. So they are, they're going to inhibit the inhibition, inhibit the ongoing suppression of movement. They will release the movement. And the direct pathway is the way that we, in fact, get out from underneath that wet blanket that suppresses all movement in order to make a movement. Okay, that's what the direct pathway is doing. What happens in Parkinson's? Now, I, I, now you're going to put two things together here. Parkinson's is a, is a problem where there's no more dopamine, okay? And it's and and then I just told you that the direct pathway is no longer working. Why is that? Well, that is because dopamine has very specific effects on the direct and indirect pathways. And that's shown here. So the direct pathway, which is used to initiate, to release movement from, the, uh, from default suppression, this is facilitated by dopamine via D1 receptors. Uh, as it turns out, the indirect pathways are suppressed by dopamine via D2 receptors. Well, if you lose the dopamine altogether, you've lost this facilitation and you've lost the inhibition. So you're getting less direct pathway and more indirect pathway. The, if the, the uh, upshot of that is less movement. And that is the cardinal sign of Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is, a, is an incredibly common disease. It, 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 it affects something uh, up to 10%, possibly even more of people over 50. Okay, so it, is, it, it, it develops over time. Uh, in most situations, it is not caused by a known mono or uh, monogenic uh, genetic condition. People may be more or less susceptible to it, but it, uh, the etiology of it and why some, one person gets it and another person doesn't, for the most part, we don't know that. Um, what happens when, when you lose this ability, to, the ability to, to engage the direct pathway? Well, the first thing that happens is that all those chunked habits become really hard to perform, okay? So imagine that instead of being able to just go on automatic pilot, you had to do every movement, even walking. You had to do it by... Uh, by volition, 
by conscious decision. Let's say that instead of, of typing T-H-E, that you, which you can do by habit, you can do that by rote through the basal ganglia. Now let's say that the, the alphabet has, has shifted by one. So T is represented by U, H is represented by I, and E is represented by F. So I can't even say it rapidly, but now you have to, you have to type U, I, F. And U, I, F, I can guarantee you, is gonna be a much slower process than typing T, H, E. Okay, you're gonna have to think it through. Now imagine that you had to do that for every action that you do in life, when you speak when you walk, when you laugh at your friend's jokes, all of those things are shifted out of the automatic realm and put into the deliberate, volitional, step-by-step -step realm. And what's gonna happen? You're gonna move a lot slower because you just can't go fast without the, uh, the engagement of chunks. And I, I just wanna share with you a couple of, um, of uh, a, a, uh, accounts of this. So this comes from a, uh, a blog, Park, Park Life in Science, um, that I highly recommend. This is a, 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 my secret life as a neuroscience professor and principal investigator with Parkinson's disease. Um, and, and, and it's worth, it's worth reading this. So one of the things it says, uh, this individual says is, I'm particularly fascinated by the freezing I experience sometimes in which I attempt to lift my hand from what it's doing and it just doesn't want to go along. I have to put effort, okay? It's no longer an automatic. It's no longer a, a habit, a chunk. I have to focus or concentrate into getting it to move. This is to such a degree that I have to pause whatever else my brain is doing, including talking or thinking, to get things going. Sometimes when no one else is around, I'll just grab it with my other hand to move it. So, it, and this, this actually also illustrates one other common point, which is that Parkinson's will typically ha uh, start on one side or it will start primarily on one side. So in this, this individual appears to be more affected on one side than the other, okay? Um, uh, and to, just to go on, I describe it this way to emphasize that Movement for me requires mental effort as opposed to physical effort. This is not, this is not a problem with, with motor neurons. It's not a problem with neuromuscular junction, and it's certainly not a problem with muscles. This is a problem with, enga with getting there, with engaging them from your, cere from your cerebrum. It's a problem in, in allowing your cerebrum to connect to the motor pathways. Um, and, and, for many people, Parkinson's advances to such a degree that it takes all the focused will they can muster to move a few steps. Uh, and, and so I just wanna go over several of the, of the primary symptoms that one sees. Uh, there is this akinesia, there is this bradykinesia, so a lack of movement, um, a s slow movement, but in addition, there's some specific uh, movement patterns that are uh, diagnostic of, of Parkinson's. And one is what's called a festinating gait. And, and uh, you should look at this, but it's a shuffling gait. Uh, so it, it, the arms don't swing, the, the steps are very uh, short, uh, and progress is, is slow. So this festinating gait is very, very, um, particular to, to Parkinson's. Another one is what's called masked faces. In other words, the, the face is simply not as expressive as uh, would normally be the case for the, for the individual that is affected. And another one is, a, uh, is when the voice gets affected. So the voice gets strained, it gets high. Uh, there's a slight preponderance of Parkinson's in men over women. Women, of course, get it too, but um, slightly more men, and, and men's voice can get, uh, can go up uh, a bit in pitch. Um, all of these things are, are very common to Parkinson's, 
And there's also, a, in many cases, in about 70% of cases, there is a resting tremor. And the, resting, the, the mechanism by which the resting tremor uh, occurs is not completely clear, um, uh, in it, it, but it doesn't occur in everybody, and it is not, is certainly not easily explained by uh, the lack of, of, of dopamine. So a person with Parkinson's, um, the first treatment typically is to replace dopamine. And we can't replace dopamine by giving dopamine. We can replace, uh, or we can largely um, ameliorate the effects of the loss of dopamine by giving more starting material to make dopamine. And just to remind you, here's the synthesis pathway from tyrosine to uh, dopamine. And the, uh, the limiting enzyme is this tyrosine hydroxylase. So we can't give this, it won't get, it won't get into the um, brain, but we can give this dopa and we can give it with other, other um, substances that are gonna aid it in, in crossing the blood-brain barrier. So the various different drugs are different formulations that are gonna assist to get this L-DOPA across the blood-brain bar barrier. And if you flood the system with the starting material, the effect is that there's gonna be more dopamine made. And because of that, dopamine is, it, this L-DOPA treatment um, is extremely effective in treating uh, individuals. And uh, one person who, who wrote a really, um, uh, I think, valuable account of being diagnosed with Parkinson's um, in a relatively young age, he, this individual, Joel Haveman, uh, got Parkinson's in his mid-40s. And, uh, and he describes very well, I think very effectively, the experience of going on uh, on L-DOPA. And, and what, what he describes and what people experience are these on and off states. So you, you take the drug and when it kicks in, you're, you're, really, you're really going. It, you're kind of off in that hyperkinetic realm where you're moving a little bit too much. And then with time, you, you hit a sweet spot, but you come off that sweet spot pretty quickly and then you're off into you you don't have enough dopamine and you're in this frozen state and people talk about the on and off states the hyperkinetic slash i'm good to go versus the off state which is too frozen to move um and uh and, and it's it's not as though and so the important one of the important things to remember is that as effective and as important as l-dopa is in treating Parkinson's, it's not a cure. And there's still this daily struggle. When do you take the drug? How am I going to take the drug so that I'm going to be effective when I have that meeting at work or when I um, go out with my spouse for my anniversary? So you're going to, you're going to, it's going to be a big piece of a person's life to try and um, plan, plan around this. Now, with time, dopa, L-dopa, the dopamine replacement therapy, um, is going to fail. It will fail eventually, uh, or it, do, it tends to fail eventually. And at that point, um, or even prior to that, one of the possibilities is deep brain stimulation. And the deep brain stimulation, two, two sites have been uh, approved for deep brain stimulation for treatment of Parkinson's in the United States. One site is the sub... Uh, thalamic nucleus, and the other site is the ventral pallidum. Um, and, uh, and what this does in the best of, of circumstances, in the best of cases, is that it gives people more on time, less off time, and it allows them to get more on time with less, uh, with less L-DOPA. So they can decrease their dose of, of, of drugs and get better uh, outcome. What it doesn't do typically is make their life wonderful all of a sudden. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is brain stimulation and that the, the results of, uh, of 
surveys have shown that, in fact, patients that get deep brain stimulators don't all of a sudden, their, their home lives and their, their work lives don't all of a sudden improve and become magically fixed. And there might be many, many reasons for that. Um, I think that it's a, it's a really sticky wicket here um, between uh, giving people hope, giving people unrealistic hope, and getting informed consent when there are so few options open to a person for whom the L-DOPA is not working or it's not working well enough. So this is a really, um, this is a place where, where ethics and bioethics really comes into play. It's a, it's a uh, decision that needs to be entered into with, uh, w with a lot of thought and a lot of consideration. And I think that there's been, then there has been progress made in how to allow patients to have true informed consent, how to uh, select the patients who might benefit from uh, uh, deep brain stimulation the most. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the indirect pathways.